Hi. Um, I want to make money out of toilet paper now. That's just so such an interesting way to make money. Um, so um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about things I've learned over the last 10 years or so, looking at ways of managing different product development in different organizations and architecture and stuff that fits around that and the, the uh, mess that that can make and leave behind you. Um, so who are we? I work at Dow Jones. Uh, Dow Jones do all these things. We're a data and information company. We run the Wall Street Journal, but we also run all sorts of other products as well. Um, I've also worked at BBC and Sky and various other places. So I've uh, spent a lot of time in media and looking at the interesting way technology is used there. Um, so we're talking about you know, what happens when you try and do cool stuff. Because you you're trying to do cool stuff, and you find it's not as easy as you thought to do cool stuff. So forget the world where you're just in a startup, and you set your own parameters, and uh, things are good. Within two to five years, everyone ends up with some legacy and something which is going to cause you a problem to try and do anything new. And I haven't met a single startup or anyone here today or anywhere else that hasn't got this problem. So you have a great product idea. And it's awesome. It's a brilliant product idea. You're going to, when you're thinking about how this product's going to work, you're thinking, we're scoping it out. We're going to make it work. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves you because you're so awesome. And you're going to make a lot of money out of this. And when you think about how this is going to work, you think, OK, what can possibly stop me? So the clicker's just going a bit slow. There you go. What can possibly stop me? So. Technical debt is my nemesis in every job I've had. It's, uh, I can't, the best, everyone will get hit by it at some point. And the best description I've come up for with technical debt, it's like an annoying, stubborn five year old child because you know you can do what you want to do, but it just won't do it. It just won't do it. It just refuses to do what you, it's just kicking and screaming. It's like a whole organization is trying to stop you from doing something that you think is so simple. Your boss is so simple, you sold the idea, it's brilliant, and then you just can't get it working because of some horrible, <laughs> nasty piece of technology somewhere in your infrastructure. And um, suddenly, it's going to take years to do something that you thought was going to take three months. And of course, the person who wrote this software, or who built the system, they may have left the company. Some of them, there's you know, some people in uh, organizations I've worked with, they genuinely no longer exist. They have died, and the systems are that old. Uh, so you have this massive problem. And in the middle of it is probably something like this. There's a computer that only came in black and white. It's so old. There's, a, there's, no, there's no way you can work around it. You can see any obvious route through it. So when you think about how that works, you then have another problem, because that's not the end of it. So this is the sort of issue. We have a lot. So uh, this is a server uh, that's been running for 2,073 days. Now, there was a time when everyone loved that. I thought, that was brilliant. This thing's, never, this thing's never gone down. It's been running for 2,073 days. This is the most terrifying thing you can find in any organization, because nobody knows what's going to happen if you have to switch this thing off. Nobody knows how it works. Nobody knows all the intricacies of the startup process. So you have all these problems in trying to figure out what does this thing actually do? Right? How do you actually figure out how you're going to change it? So what's your plan? So your first instinct is, right, let's throw all this crap away. Let's just get rid of it. Uh, but that is an exact description of uh, trashloop.com, because you try and get rid of it, and it will just bounce back and come at you in some other way. So it, the thing about throwing it away is it's not really, it's not really a, you know, uh, a plan. It's just a goal, right? You want to try and get rid of it, but it's not a plan, so I'm just going to throw it away. You need to know what you're going to do about it. So this is the world of complexity. This is the world of problems. And you end up with massive scope creep. You end up with increased costs, and suddenly your product is not looking like it's going to be a good idea anymore because it's going to take forever. So the first thing I've learned from these systems, and some of this is, uh, you know, Fairly feels like fairly straightforward knowledge, but you would be amazed how many times you don't do these things when you're trying to tackle these problems. So the first thing to do is make it stable. Right? You need to stabilize it. It's some way of taking something old, because when you think about old systems, I'll come onto this. It's not that they're all rubbish. The way they were built was built for a particular purpose, and that purpose didn't incorporate change. That's the biggest problem you have, and I'll talk a bit about that later. But you need to find a way to stabilize these things. If it's running on an old system and it's falling over, just get it stable. Find some way to manage it. And then you need to wrap it up. So by wrapping it up, uh, 
find a way to put a layer around it, a facade, so that that can be used as, a, as an approach to build new product. Because if you spend all your time trying to rebuild old systems, all you do is move sideways. You don't move forward. You build exactly the same thing, and your boss doesn't love you anymore because you now have the same thing, just in a different system. And that doesn't read too well to the CEO. So the mechanism we use the most, though, is, is really putting a, an API facade around things. So I'll just explain what APIs is. This is how I explain APIs to most people in the business, just and play the video. Basically, that's what APIs do. So the problem with computers is they don't really understand each other. And even when they're, they can be speaking the same language, they can be, you know, those, those two babies are not even speaking the same language. They're just using a one-word vocabulary. That's all they're talking, the same word. And yet they have no idea what they're talking about. I think, I've watched it quite a few times this video. I think they're trying to talk about socks. There's one of them's got one sock on, and one of them's got two, maybe, but I don't know. But that's basically what you're trying to do. You're trying to get the systems to talk to each other in a way so that you can start to understand what's going on inside it. So that's what APIs are. That's basically the best way to explain APIs to your CEO. Um, and the final thing is, is extending it. So once you've got a stable house, you can then build an extension on it. You can start to pull things around it and then start to use that as like a sidecar to be able to move your world forward. So the way I, I think about this is like putting old systems in a care home. So imagine they're, they're they're older and they need love. They're not to be hated. They need to be taken care of. That's the best way to think about it. Because otherwise, you will want to go around with an ax and break up your data center for every machine you see that is running all these old systems. You have to think about what you can do with them and how you can use them. So take them somewhere. Put them somewhere nice where they can still feel useful. And uh, you know, they can go out bowling together and whatever old systems do. But um, that comes down to a simple approach, which is you look at the old service. So when you have old services, you have lots of point-to-point -point communication, lots of points where things are coming in. They're not all coming through any consistent way. They're coming into different parts of the system. Not all the pieces talk to each other. And they tend to be very confusing to figure out what's going on inside, because there's so many different mechanisms to get information in and out. So the first thing to do, as we were saying, is just wrap it up. Put a single point in, something very straightforward, so you can start to see what's going on. And once you've stabilized it, then you're protecting yourself from some of the issues running underneath, and that allows you to build things and move faster. You then need to build your sidecar. So that then talks to the old system. So this is where you start putting your new functionality and your new product starts building off this. And then put an API on top of that so you can talk to both of these things in one way. That's a very simple description, but that's basically the best way to think about the legacy and the issues you have in older architectures. And over time, you then shrink it down, so you make that smaller, and you start to uh, think about how you scale it. Now, one of the things that's definitely true is that only simplicity scales. Only simplicity scales well. So anything that you're building that's complicated tends to become a problem as you try and scale it. And this affects the way you think about performance and the way you think about uh, no, at being an ex-engineer. You tend to think about building code that was really efficient and really fast, and actually tend to think about scale first now how it scales horizontally, because a lot of performance issues you can fix later. But if it doesn't scale horizontally, you can't do much about that. You have to go and re-engineer it. And this is a fundamental thing that the cloud brought down, which when, as an engineer, you tend to think that's uh, the wrong way to do things. And it does challenge everything you learn about being a really smart engineer and building things really well. It's actually about building things well that scale. So you break things up. Think about microservices and service, uh, service architectures, which can drive lots of functionality very quickly and have very few dependencies. That is by far the easiest way to scale anything. So you know, Lego blocks and ways of putting stuff together as quickly as possible through APIs and services is the way we found very efficient in order to start to think about how services work. And the, there's also, uh, and it's an example of this, at the BBC, we took one of the, the content management systems, which was, it was um, loved but it was also very difficult to manage. So we, and it wouldn't do some of the new things we wanted, so we, we effectively cut the head off it. The system thought it was still publishing to the web, but it wasn't. It was going through a queue and publishing to another system that was taking care of everything. And that allowed us to move forward very quickly without having to re-engineer the whole thing, which, was, which would have taken years. Um, and actually, 
the people who were using it didn't hate it that much. It was OK. So uh, these sort of approaches actually are quite efficient to move you forward. Um, and that comes down to the next thing. So you've got technical debt, but cultural debt. Cultural debt is the most fascinating problem in any organization. When you think about cultural debt is when you try and come up with a new idea, and every idea you come up with seems to look like all the ideas you've ever had before, because everyone pushes everything into a, into a certain funnel. And this is the hardest thing for any company to do. It's the thing that stops companies pivoting. It's the thing that stops them thinking about new opportunities, because they just they, culturally, they just find it so, so hard to think differently. Um, so don't kill the old systems. Shrink them, manage them, make sure it's under control. You can start to move forward and switch off at your leisure. Now the, the next thing is how you predict um, complexity. So I'll give you some examples of some of my favorite uh, technology predictions. Um, the Americans need the telephone, but we don't because we have messenger boys. That was the British post office. We have uh, the horse is here to stay, but the car is a novelty. That was someone advising uh, Henry Ford's lawyer, whether or not to invest in them. It's a good prediction. Um, there was no research no, anyone would want a computer. That's from the founder of uh, DEC. There is uh, uh, cellular phones will actually not replace vocal wire systems. Of course they won't. And uh, there's just not that many videos I want to watch, was the founder of YouTube. Um, the, one of my favorite is probably this one, though, which is the nuclear powered vacuum cleaner will probably be a reality within 10 years, which I. I'm still, waiting. I'm still waiting for a flying car, frankly. Uh, but the, the nuclear-powered vacuum cleaner sounds both amazing and absolutely terrifying at the same time. So we think about complexity. So this is a framework that's quite interesting to think about complexity. Why do things get complex? So it's called Kinefin, and it's a useful, I wouldn't so you don't have to understand all the bits of it, but it's very interesting at the top level to think about why are some things hard? That's really what this is about. So in the bottom right, you have known things that you've done before, that people you know have built before or understand quite well. Those things are easy. You then go around to things that are knowable, so maybe you don't know it, but you know people that know it, or you have some patterns to follow that make complete sense, but they're still fairly simple. You then have complex things, which are less repeatable, and you may have some guidelines or something to guide you there, but you're getting into a more complex world. And then you have the bottom left, where you have chaotic stuff, where things are not repeatable, and all you can do is just use some principles and some common sense to start to attack the problem. And the further you found yourself around that towards chaotic, that project is getting complex. And that's your biggest issue in trying to manage complexity. This is in large organizations especially, when you're trying to manage this stuff, and people aren't being clear about what they want, and they don't really understand what they're trying to do, that's the first signs of moving around this scale. And if you find yourself anywhere towards the left and anywhere near the middle, you are in deep trouble because that project is not going to move fast because no one knows what they want and no one knows how to do it. So it's interesting to think about your projects. Just think about where they sit on the scale and try and then figure out how you're going to address that problem because this is a, it's a very simple, common sense way to look at it, but I like the way it structures things. Um, so then you get to the next thing, which is data debt. So you've, suddenly you've got your system under control, you're trying to manage the complexity, you're trying to deal with the cultural debt, and then you get data debt. And data debt is almost worse than technical debt, because data debt is hidden away underneath the system, um, but nobody really cared about it for years. You'll find people just chuck data into systems, they chuck data into all sorts of formats and different places, and uh, no one understood how it's going to come together when you started to rebuild your system or your product. No one knew how this is going to work. So everyone has a different view of it. There's a guy, uh, when I went to the Financial Times, a guy spent a month just trying to get everyone to agree what a, sub what a cancellation meant. Does everyone agree what that means? So until you understand some of those basic fundamentals of your business, you, you can't do anything. You're not, you can't be informed. You can't make good data decisions. So you really need to get to the bottom of this and manage it with some simple solutions to start moving forward. Um, and forget about marketing terms and forget about big data. I met a guy from NASA that put me in my place once. I do not have any problems with big data. He has big data. I don't have big data. None of us really have big data. Um, when you're thinking about what you're trying to manage, try and just break it down to some clear, actionable purpose, things that you can do something about, and just focus on that, just one thing, get one thing straight and build from there. What we did at the FT is we chucked everything out into a big data warehouse and then started to build up from that. And it's, the FT is a very data-driven organization now. It punches way above its weight because of, uh, because of the way it uses data. And uh, that's the same approach I've used elsewhere. You know, it's a very straightforward 
and simple way to start managing your problem. But the most important thing is don't do it until you know what you mean by your data. Get some understanding. So, and as I said, just make it actionable. Make it sure it's things you can actually uh, you can do something about. So this is an example of what we've done there. So we started to use machine learning to look at subscribers and how reading patterns work. Um, we thought about how were those categorized into different types of user, and then we started to plan out not just what they might be doing, but how their, their propensity models, you know, will they subscribe or not? Will they start to use uh, different parts of the service? And you've got to remember, you know, 15 years ago, we had no idea what anyone was doing with the Wall Street Journal. You'd sort of, you, know, you might get some letters to the editor, but that was all you knew. Now you have this amazing richness of data. So this is a huge opportunity, and, and on a global scale, helps massively to drive you forward. Um, so we start to think about a thing called the knowledge engine, which sits in the middle. That is then looking at the way we classify and segment. We look at churn. We look at different ways that people are coming into the service, how often they come, that sort of stuff. And then building up some models from that and some actionable things we can do, things we can actually make sense out of. So that's one of the things we're doing it. I think the most important thing about this is that overall, your plan is really just about change. Change is your biggest issue, if you can manage architectures and build things which cope with change, you're generally in a good place where right? you can move quickly. The biggest problem with the architectures you find in, in a lot of places after three or four years, you look back and think that wasn't really built to cope with this, and that's because it wasn't built to cope with change. The spec, the way it was set up, wasn't, wasn't designed with that in mind. And the past part of the problem here is people think of change in quite a straightforward way. They think about you know, that we're moving from one stable state to another stable state. And maybe that was the way things worked years ago. Um, but there is no stopping of change now, and it's not something that happens in that way. We don't l move from one state to another. We have to get used to moving all the time. It's got to get used to everything changing. And once you're comfortable with that, you're in a great place. That's part of the job of being, being a CTO, is just being a sort of change psychotherapist. Just go around making everyone comfortable with the fact everything's going to change. You know what you used to do? People aren't even going to do that in 10 years. They won't even have that device. So what are you going to do about that? And trying to get people to understand that within, within your business so they can get their head around the idea of change. So adapting to this is one of the most important things. And you know, product changes are fast and furious. So I used to use this slide for a joke because I think you know, this is the iPhone strapped to your face platform. And then, of course, Google go and do this. So Google Cardboard is now a real thing. We've just done a big deal with Google on, on VR to uh, the Wall Street Journal to build out on the Daydream platform. So that's their new sort of VR tool set. Uh, and that, you know, you can't really predict these things are going to happen. Things that look ridiculous are also probably the most likely things to go forward. So what can stop you from embracing change? So I tend to think about it in this way. If your organization is trying to pull in two directions, as technologists and as designers and people who are trying to build things that go into the future, you're trying to think about platforms and build stuff which is reusable. And then you have a large number of people who are not measured on that. They just want to go and build features. So if you spend too much time building features, you're never going to move forward. You're going to build up huge amounts of debt, and eventually you will crumble under the weight of it all and spend years trying to re-engineer it. And if you spend too long building platforms, you won't, your company probably won't exist. You'll just have a great platform but no product. So you have to try and find a way to manage this middle curve. So it starts off by proving features out quickly. You've got to find a way to actually quickly get stuff done to show it's worth doing something. But then you've immediately got to have every product has to peck back to the platform. There's some way you've got to find to make sure that you're building something that scales and works into the future. And if you think about the power of platforms, they don't even have to be your platforms. Now, Uber is a collection of platforms. These are all the pieces they use to build their platform. Um, and when you think about change, so cultural debts, one of the things around iPlayer was fascinating was just when, you, um, when we started to build it, it wasn't that people didn't want to do the service. They just genuinely didn't understand why you would put TV on the internet. You know, it was people watch TV on TV. Why would, you, why would you do that? Why would people want to do it? And this is before YouTube. This is a long time ago. But it's something where you know, the, the understanding to get into your organization around what's happening and changing around you is, is surprisingly difficult. Um, and we, you know, we've had to change the way we create, so we talked about, uh, talked about VR for a moment. We're building out new ways of thinking about this and trying to get people excited about these ideas and what we can do with it with storytelling and uh, the ways we use this technology. And that's, uh, like I said, that's linked in with the, now linked in with the Google deal we're doing. And the way we distribute things as well. So I've, this is a fascinating slide from Mary Meeker's yearly deck, but 
the number of mobile phone uh, subscriptions massively outnumbers the number of people using phones. Uh, and you can see that the potential for the number of devices and the way people use content just keeps growing. So we've had to think about some of the, tech, some of the content and redefining it, things that people thought were maybe not so, wouldn't be so popular into the future, but podcasts are becoming very popular. Um, we're on Snapchat. We're, we built a, a bot to go into Facebook, the, the bot launch, so that will answer questions for you about some of the content and services we cover. So you can, getting this sort of level of understanding into the newsroom and the way people work is, is a huge step forward. So the summary is um, care about your legacy. Just take care of it because it will come and kick you in the ass if you don't. Um, when you think about the old systems, just wrap them up and don't, you don't have to switch them all off because the cost of switching off that last 10% of something could, could be incredibly expensive. Once it's under control, just leave it. You know, there, are, there are things you can do to manage it and you find a way to wrap around it, you're in a good place. Um, and uh, again, thinking about scaling. So try and find ways to build things built for change that scale well, that can drive you forward. Just expect change. That's the most important thing. So thanks for listening. Thank you.